So I will try to do an alternative history of progress because I didn't like the history that they taught us in school and I don't particularly like the received histories that basically uh, the way history is presented is very much like the way we do our CVs when we're looking for a job where everything is structured in order and one thing followed the next as if it was all intended. So we get this upward arc of progress. Uh, so we start with the ancient Greeks, the Romans, don't mention the Saxons, Normans. We get the Reformation, the Tudors. Then we get Columbus going off and discovering America. And not long after that, you get the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment leads to the Industrial Revolution. We get the Age of Steam. Start of the Oil Age. Don't mention the Germans again. Then we get the American Dream. Landing men on the moon. And of course, the apex of progress, the mobile phone. Uh, it's sort of the way it's often presented, that you know, one thing led to the other. And it was all this sort of linear and ever upwards and onwards, whereas, I mean, I take the view that it's far more complicated and that energy is a big driver within it. Uh, so what I've put up here are what I think are the four drivers. And in a way, it goes back to why the Romans didn't industrialize, which is one of the big questions. Uh, the first thing is to do with guns. Um, if you went back to the 1500s, which is about the time that the Western European empires started to take off, I had. were you able to time travel? If you were asked at that period in time who was going to emerge to become the sort of dominant power across the globe, you would likely have said Ming China, like far more advanced than Western Europe at the time, far greater history of developing knowledge. I, of course, China invented gunpowder or discovered gunpowder, but the Chinese never used it in warfare. Now, the reason they didn't is similar, in a sense, to the Romans, that the military problem that they faced was very different to what emerged in Europe. So the Romans, like the Ming, struggled with external tribes coming in and raiding. Now, the military that you need in order to combat encroaching tribes is a fast-moving, lightweight military. Now, because the early cannons, which first appeared in Europe, uh, they were on the battlefield at the Battle of Cressy, which is like 1346. Uh, I think the original ones used to just fire lumps of stone, <laughs> but they gradually refined it. The image there is it's a representation of the Battle of Agincourt. Uh, by Agincourt, not only do you have metal cannons, but you've also got the first muskets. And again, the muskets are incredibly heavy. To fire them, you had to have a kind of tripod stand to hold the barrel while you fired. In Europe, when you think of Europe in the Middle Ages, you've got a load of emerging competing empires. You've got Portugal, Spain, and Spain at one point is Castile and Aragon, so there's two in there. You've got the French emerging, you've got Burgundy, you've got England, you've got Scotland, you've got Sweden at one point expands into Europe. There's Poland, Lithuania in their Commonwealth at one point expands. Um, but there's no external tribes because we're surrounded by sea. So basically the powers we're up against are in close proximity and they're almost always in competition. So that the kind of warfare we have involves marching large scale armies as big as you can, as big as you can feed. You march them onto a field, you all stand in a line, and you all beat seven bells or whatever out of yourselves. And whoever's left standing at the end of the day wins. Militarily, you get into a competition between each of the empires. The way it works is that every time one or other of the European empires looks like it's about to take over, all of the other empires get together and give it a good kicking and get it back down. So at one point, you've got the Spanish Habsburgs round about the time that they're colonizing America look like they're going to take over you. But then everyone clubs together and stops them. But a century later, it's the French, 
then the French end up in competition with the British and yeah, and eventually it's the British that emerge in the 19th century to become the British Empire. But it's for the first time moving outside Europe rather than trying to take over Europe. So the, and then the basis of British policy throughout is to make sure that no European power ever becomes dominant, which is why Britain fights the French for a long time and then later fights the Germans. So that part of a ship is called a forecastle. Uh, I don't know how many people know where it comes from, but it's from a forward castle. Because uh, around about the time they're fighting the Battle of Cressy, the navies at the time are on fairly rickety boats, but you have towers either end with archers in them. I mean, either to shoot at the enemy ships or to shoot from the ship onto the land. Um, but of course, as cannons emerge, these rickety ships have to be built in a different way. So you get a revolution in shipbuilding in order to turn what was an archer platform into a gun platform. Uh, as, you know, over the, once you started doing it so from the time of the Spanish Armada, you start then getting competition for who can build the sturdiest ships and mount the biggest number of guns. And the bottom one there is the victory, uh, which is what, 1806, when you have the Battle of Trafalgar. Um, you know, so if you like this accident of being able to deploy cannons on a battlefield in France in 1346 leads you to ha having ships as gun platforms. And of course, in a modern Navy, you'd have coal powered, then oil powered ships mounting huge guns that can fire sort of one ton projectiles you know, for miles and miles. Uh, was it during the Normandy invasion? They were lobbing shells 15 miles inland. Um, now, there is an economic driver, which is actually to do with toll booths. Um, if you were in Europe round about the end of the 1400s, you would have things from the East, spices and silks that were incredibly desirable. Problem you had if you were in Europe was they were at the final end of a very long silk route. And at every stage along the silk road, there would be a count or a duke or a king putting his tax collector on the road to take a cut of all of the traffic that was going through. So that by the time you got to the trade fairs of medieval Europe, only the very wealthy could afford those goods. So you had an economic driver as you developed your heavy going new, new ship building techniques, heavy going gun platforms, you now have the kind of ships that can sail around the tip of Africa and sail east to the Indies and to China to pick up the spices and the silks. Uh, and basically you cut out all of those middlemen so you deal with the arbitrage. Because uh, instead of having to sell with all of the taxes built in, you've now avoided all of those taxes. You bring the cargo back by ship and then you sell it directly into Europe. Uh, the final driver, which I think is the big one, is that in any economy, you have to have energy to drive things. And one of the things that was happening in Europe after it had recovered from the Black Death and it had built into the sort of 14th, 15th centuries, was they chopped down all the wood. Uh, it's not strictly true because you still had royal forests and stuff that were protected, but that wood was used in building, you needed it for your ships, and it was your fuel source. As the population expanded through the 1500s, or through the 1400s, there were huge shortages for fuel, for building, for shipbuilding, so you had to look further afield. One of the things that Britain benefits from in its way, I mean, it's a twisted benefit. The main European source of timber in those days was the Baltic. But the British, were what, they feared going into the Baltic in case they got blockaded on the straits between Denmark and Sweden on the way back. 
they forced the British to go round the North Cape of Scandinavia to Russia for timber. And the kind of ships that you needed to build for getting round the North Cape, which is still hazardous even today, that kind of ship was ideal for crossing and picking up and taking goods to the Americas. So it opened that pathway. Um, building wise, initially it's the rich that start using bricks. It's brought in as a kind of luxury building. Uh, I think they get the technique from the Dutch. But gradually you see that shift. So if you think of sort of Henry VIII type of time, it's always these kind of wooden frame timber buildings. If you think of Elizabethan building, it's red brick. Uh, the, so it's the smaller, thin red bricks that they had in Elizabethan times. Uh, in fact, you'll often find you know, those walled gardens, the market gardens. You often find the, the is Elizabethan ones still standing. Um, so yes, you get the revolution in building, revolution in shipbuilding, and then you get them starting to turn to what they considered to be an inferior fuel because it burned too hot which Britain had lots of, which was coal. Um, so once you start using coal, then people start learning what is the best way to use it, what are its potential applications. So you're laying, I mean, if you were seeing the development of progress as a line, you'd be laying the foundations for industrialization, but that isn't what they were doing. Uh, this is the point that we talked about with Gail Ferber of saying this is a self-organizing dissipative system that people are just responding to the conditions that they see around them and working to whatever suits best. And the end product is you know, what Nate Hagens calls the superorganism. That there is no driving mind behind it. It's not going in, in any particular direction. It's just dealing with things as we find them. So we then get to the developments of modern money. Uh, so the picture on the left is uh, this one, is the first joint stock companies, which were used to fund the ship routes to the east to go and get the silks and the spices to bring back. Uh, and the first trade ship that they brought back into England made over a thousand percent profit. So you start getting that idea that we club together and we all buy shares in the venture that enables the venture to take place. And then we all get a bigger return than what we put in. You know, so that, that becomes an expectation of the way we trade, which wouldn't necessarily have been there prior to the joint stock company. Uh, the other thing that you start to get is the banks. Um, the Bank of England, uh, this picture is a representation of the Bank of England being founded, which is uh, 1694. It is in direct response to the British Navy being defeated by the French in 1690. And the government is looking for a way to fund the rebuilding of a navy. Uh, so setting up a central bank becomes a way of government raising revenue. So again, you're getting the basis coming out of this of a modern monetary system. Again, not happening because people are looking at this upward arc of progress, but just because this is what makes sense at the time. Uh, now most people in Britain at the time wouldn't have dealt with money. Uh, money was essentially something that you used for paying itinerant people you know, who came in from outside. So soldiers, sailors, merchants, you know, ordinary people would have operated with each other on a obligation basis. You know, I need a few of your apples. I'll give you some of my duck eggs next spring. You, know, and you wouldn't worry about the quantity. So it was just whatever you need. Almost Marxist, you know, from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. Um, that's almost a dual system. But this is where money for warfare and money for financing trade starts to morph into the dominant system from these times. Uh, Europe also had a great degree of luck. And it's basically 
because of the way the ocean gyres and wind trade winds operated. The, the crossing from Europe to the Americas is about 3,000 miles. The crossing from China to the Americas is about 8,000. And because of the trade wind, it takes almost twice as long for a Chinese vessel to have sailed to the Americas and back. One of the things that meant was whereas the British could provision a colony, or whereas it would have been the Spanish, you know, Spanish and Portuguese initially, they could actually send ships with enough food and goods on board to actually establish a colony in a way that the Chinese never could. Uh, I mean, there's some dispute as to whether the Chinese ever actually went to America. There are some people reckon that they did. They certainly had the ships that would have enabled them to do so. But it's unlikely they'd have been able to do more than trade. Uh, and it's actually not long after the European empires start expanding to America that the Chinese effectively close off their economy and stop doing sort of oceanic ships at all. Their shipping after that period is just coastal you know, fishing boats. Um, but as I say, because of that accident, that the trade routes favor Europeans traveling to America, at the period that the Europeans arrive, the natives, Native Americans had previously had nation states in the same way as Europe had. That they'd been through a series of civil wars prior to the arrival of the Europeans. So that in a sense, the other accident was they were easy picking for sort of voracious Europeans to come and take over their land. The American Thanksgiving Day, which is remembered as the Native Americans arriving with turkeys to feed the colonists, was actually one group of Native Americans who saw the white Europeans as a potential ally against another group of Europeans, and they made the mistake of feeding the Europeans. Um, yeah, they've reaped the consequences ever since, sadly. Um, so the other thing it sets up is this early trading system where your outward journey would take you around the European coast and around the curve of West Africa, then across using the trade winds and the ocean currents to the Caribbean, to the north coast of South America and into the Americas. It just so happens in that part of Africa is a, an empire that trades in slaves had been supplying the Ottomans with slaves for centuries. And Europeans discover that you can trade with that empire by sending manufactured goods from Europe to them, taking slaves from them across to the colonies and using the slaves effectively as your energy source. Um, that they provide the human labor to grow all of the commodities that are now going to, and they are plantated. Uh, so it isn't that we're going there and just taking over just indigenous crops, and we also take our own. Um, and yes, we start there. So raw materials to Europe. Europe manufactures goods with the raw materials and exchanges them both with the Africans and the Americans. Uh, slavery as a form of power. Uh, and yes, yeah, that keeps this Atlantic system going. There's a bit that they leave out. Um, so of all of the commodities, I mean, there are four that I think are important that tend to get slightly downplayed. Uh, so this one at the bottom is sugar coats. Um, I, there is sugar grown in Cyprus prior to the colonization of the Americas, but very small quantities. It's from the Americas that you develop this sort of voracious desire for sugar in Europe. Tobacco we know about, Walter Raleigh and clay pipes and all of that. Coffee and the occasional white something to put up your nose if you are the key industrial crop is cotton. I think Eric Hobsbawm in his history and empire actually starts by saying, he who says industry says cotton, because uh, that cotton is going to go back to England and be turned into cotton cloth. 
Um, but to talk about the Enlightenment briefly, you know, we've seized up for. There we are. I think it's no accident that the Enlightenment emerges out of the coffee houses of England and pa of London and Paris, because that's where all of these are coming to. Um, today, we think of sugar as a kind of enemy, that it's this horrible substance that's killing us all. Back then, people were calorie starved. So one of the things that the importation of sugar does is it brings in a, an enormous extra amount of calories. And that's providing the energy, if you like, for all of these brains to think all of these ideas that they're having. Um, the other problem that Europeans had for all centuries was that our drinks, I mean, you didn't in those days drink the water. Um, I mean, unless you were fortunate enough to live well out in a rural area where you had spring water. If you were in a village, the odds are your water is polluted with all sorts of bacteria and stuff. And if you drink the water directly, it kills you. So in Northern Europe, people were turned to small beer. In Southern Europe, people turned to wine. And basically, Europeans spent centuries in a sort of mild alcoholic haze which wasn't particularly conducive to thinking about anything. So all of a sudden, you get coffee coming along. You've got a bitter drink that you sweeten with sugar, but it's made with boiling water. So for the first time, you have a drink that not only is safe to drink, but it's actually stimulating you. So whereas the alcohol would have dumbed you down, this is actually starting to brighten you up. Then you've got the sort of mildly mind altering effects of the tobacco and possibly anything else that they could get hold of. And all of that is fueling these people to start thinking back to the Greek philosophers or looking at Roman engineering or and starting to figure out how they did it and how we might improve it. Um, and again, so again, it's this accidental development. It wasn't planned. Um, and these people weren't on their own thinking of stuff beforehand. It was the produce of the colonies that enabled them to do the thinking. Um, and, I mean, they were a very select class. I mean, this wasn't ordinary working people. Uh, although, I mean, ordinary working people would also benefit from the extra calories in the sugar. So from this... You get the, what I think are the three ideologies of progress. The first is liberalism. That progress is happening, it's a good thing. What we need to do is promote reforms that speed progress along. Um, it's very much in line with the sort of capitalist economy that's emerging at the same time. Uh, and very opposed to the old feudal arrangements that had predated it. You then get its antithesis in, in conservatism, which also agrees that progress is happening, but it says this is dangerous, it undermines traditional structures, we need to be careful what we get rid of in case we discover that we need it. And the third, which emerges later, is Marxism, which agrees with liberalism to an extent that yes, progress is happening, yes, it's a good thing. But once these capitalists get established and become the new ruling class, they put the brakes on progress and they get in the way. So that only the proletarian revolution can really wipe them away and usher in the new age of progress. The point is we still today are having arguments around those three core ideas. And all three are rooted in the idea that progress is real. Uh, you know, that we are on that upward and ever onward arc of progress, and that what we're arguing about is how to do it best. Uh, you know, very few of us are arguing that no progress doesn't exist. Go back to the industrialization. So certainly there are people starting to think about the world in a different way. They're starting to come up with, I mean, particularly the machinery of industry, where you have these engineers figuring out you know, how to weave cloth. And, 
Uh, it's actually the bottom picture there, which is an early part of the British Empire before they colored in the map pink. The crucial thing is the goods coming out of Britain and going to the rest of its empire. Because how the colonial system worked was that the colonies weren't allowed to produce manufactured goods. So if you think about the American Revolution, everyone thinks, oh, that was about taxes, which is that it was the taxes they imposed after the war with France that was like the triggering event for it. One of the big resentments was the Americans had all of the raw materials and commodities to make their own goods, but they were forbidden by the British to do so. Because they did it anyway. <laughs> that is one of the reasons they were able to fight, is because they were able to make their own guns. Um, you know, because again, it's a self organizing participative system. You know, people do what suits them at the time. Um, we enter a period, it's quite brief. I think it's actually close to the height of what you can do on renewable energy alone, which is why I put the water wheel there. As the original British cotton mills were based in Lancashire because of the high valleys and the access to water power. So if you like, coal comes later. There's a short period where the factories are run on water. Um, yeah, and you do churn out a large volume of goods. It is possible to do a lot of things with renewable energy. The thing that you can't do with it is run a massive industrial economy. Um, and yes, it's not long after because people are turning to coal as you know, they're learning to use coal, that you start using coal for powering the machinery instead of using the water. That starts to allow you to have your factories pretty much anywhere. Um, so then it opens the question, why Britain, you know, why not France? Uh, yes, Britain has coal, Britain has the iron ore, it has access to water, and it's already got its colonies for the trading system. But arguably France has all of that as well. If you go to the northeastern part of France up near Belgium, that had a lot of iron ore and coal. Uh, the main reason seems to be that the British lacked a population. Um, so... I, mean, I don't know how accurate the figures are, you know, because you go on what was recorded officially in those days, but the French population was nearly three times the size of Britain, or that would have been England and Scotland at the time. Um, basically, if you don't have people, but you're wanting to increase output, it makes sense to use inanimate machinery. And if you've got access to the coal to drive the machinery, so much the better. Um, but basically, so using the machinery, you can produce more than three times what you would have produced with workers. Again, it goes back to why the Romans didn't industrialize. Again, they had access to all of this, but they never did it. But the Romans also cut down all of their trees. But their reason was they had a, at the time, a relatively huge population to draw on. So you just forced people to do more. Uh, that was what the French did. So that by the time of the revolution, the French are worried that they're lagging behind. In terms of output, they actually weren't. But the mood in France was that Britain was overtaking them and something needed to be done. So I think by the time you get to the end of the Napoleonic Wars, so Britain is now emerging as the big European power. It's starting to stretch its empire. In the course of the 19th century, they'll actually add to it. But I think you have pretty much all of the foundations for what we see as the modern world. So you've moved from a sort of agrarian feudal system into a capitalistic industrial system. You've started doing now the difference between imperialism and col colonialism. Colonialism was Europeans taking groups of Europeans and putting them in somebody else's country or on somebody else's land. And there they would produce commodities for shipping back to the home country. Imperialism works by selling people the fruits of industrialization. Uh, so basically, you ban India from making its own cotton, then you take shiploads of cotton from Britain. 
and you say to the Indian rulers, how would you like to corner the market in Indian cotton sales? And the local rulers rub their hands together and say, that's okay with us. How shall we have a deal? So you say, yes, you pay me a thousand pounds for my shipload of cotton and you can sell it wherever you like. And the Indian ruler says, where do I get a thousand pounds from? So I've got a bank for you. You borrow the money off me at interest. You make a shed load of money off your people selling them cotton that they used to be able to make, but no longer can. You get rich, we get rich, they get poor, and nobody cares. That's what I refer to as the wealth pump. And we do it with railways later on as the railways develop. We sell railways to the Canadians, the Argentinians, the Australia, the Sydney Harbour Bridge is made from iron and steel made in South Wales. That we, you know, I mean, basically we go to the ruling class there, get them to borrow a load of money on behalf of their people and their people's taxes are going to pay it back. And that pumps the money back to us. But the Suez Canal is built with loans from the French and the British. And when the interest rates get to the point where the Egyptians can no longer keep up the payments, the British army just arrives. And they don't take Egypt over as a colony. It was called a protectorate. And it's basically the British army just arrived, sat down in the cafes and palaces of, Egypt, of Cairo and just said, you know, don't mind us, you carry on. We're just here to protect our investment. Of course, it, uh, so there's, there's an irony that the end of the British Empire comes with the attempt to take the canal back when it's nationalized under Nasser in 1956. Um, but that's how imperialism works. They replace dollars for pounds for the modern world, and you see how the Americans do it. You know, the America coming out of the Second World War, it's the most advanced economy on the planet. It's got everything from flash cars to chewing gum. And everybody around the world wants a piece of it. So what do you do? You borrow in dollars. They can charge interest on it. The ruling class gets rich. The poor get poor. Uh, that is how the trick is done. Uh, you know, so is it progress? I, you can look at some of the way that we live and say, yes, there is a progression. That there are things that we gradually learn to do better. But a lot of it depends on having the material basis for it. So without the energy, uh, yeah, I mean, if you take a vacuum cleaner and run around, you know, that's great at picking up dust, but take away the electricity and you're back to taking the carpet outside and beating it with a stick. Uh, so you'd say the vacuum cleaner is progress, but without the energy, you can't do it. Uh, their big progress was, and it is a giant leap. And it's the energy difference between what you can get from renewable energy to what you get from fossil fuels. So is my quote going to come up? Yeah, this was Frederick Soddy, who was an English chemist, who after the 1929 crash decided that economists were idiots who didn't know what they were talking about and somebody scientific needed to go and look at how the economy works. And he says, the flamboyant era through which we have been passing is not due to our own merits, but to our having inherited accumulations of solar energy from the Carboniferous era, so that life for once has been able to live beyond its income. Had it but known it, it might have been a merrier age. Uh, so the problem in the graphs that you see there, the top one is British coal production, which Stanley Jevons in the 1860s is warning the British that you know, we have this precious resource that is a once and done. Uh, you burn through it now and you're not going to have it later. So we ought to be you know, treating it as precious. Because what's happening is people are regarding it just at the price it costs to dig it out of the ground, not at the value it gives you in return. So we exponentially grow our production until 1913, then it peaks. It's kept up artificially through subsidies because it's essential during the wars. It takes us back to one of those German incidents where it always seems to be the Germans that mess up the line of progress by taking us backwards. But 
you get the First World War and Britain is obliged to keep digging coal, even though it's no longer profitable. Same with the Second World War. Um, after the invasion of Normandy in 1944, the British are returning soldiers from the army to go down the mines. Because actually obtaining the coal to drive the military machine is more important than having somebody in a trench firing a gun. Uh, the bottom graph is our energy per capita, which you know, again, it, it's managed to stay stable until recently. Uh, not least because the British discovered oil and gas in the North Sea, which again is another once and done. Uh, the bottom graph here, I picked it up from a guy called Blair Fix. I have no idea whether that's his real name on a blog called Economics from the Top Down. What this is, is British energy per capita relative to the energy used in the rest of the world. So that if you like, the peak of that comes in 1900 with the Second World War. So by that stage, you've got American industrialization and German industrialization is overtaking Britain. So that Britain is already going into a relative decline. Uh, right down the bottom, you get the tiny blip <laughs> For the North Sea, you know, which lasted for just a couple of decades. At its height, we were pumping more oil out of the North Sea than Q8 was pumping. And of course, it, it, the, the faster you pump the stuff, the sooner it's done. All of the income, the wealth that could have been created from digging out that oil was thrown away on tax cuts to the rich and actually to fund the benefits of people who've been laid off because they closed all of the industry. So yes, you send all of your manufacturing to the Far East, that gives you cheaper goods coming in, but it means you've got far more people who are economically inactive at home. And the oil and gas was used to subsidize all of that, uh, you know, which is why the current government playing around with tax cuts makes no sense because they don't have the North Sea to back it up, but they will find that out in due course. Um, and yes, you know, we are close in per capita energy terms to where we were right at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Um, for Britain, that spells a coming catastrophe. Um, I see no real way that you get out of it because we don't produce anything that we could exchange for energy. And Britain's biggest export is Scots whiskey, which is nice and all that, but in an energy constrained world, that might not be the first thing that people are looking to buy. Uh, although we may here be able to follow the Russian example when their economy collapsed in the 1990s, and we can all drink ourselves to death as a way of avoiding the consequences. <laughs> but yes, we look around the world and there are all of these things that we would consider progress. Um, We've seen the population leap from about a billion worldwide at the start of the Industrial Revolution. We're now getting up towards eight. Uh, there's a reason that, that, gra that both graphs have more or less the same shape. So the top graph is the energy that we use. Uh, it's basically all of those people are alive because of all of that fossil fuel burning. Take away that fossil fuel burning, whether it's in direct energy or whether it's using gas as a feedstock for fertilizers to grow food. Take that away and that population has to shrink back to about one billion, possibly less. Because one billion is about as good as you can do on renewable energy. Um, so woe betide any economy or any continent that is foolish enough to disconnect itself rapidly from its energy supply. Which brings us back to don't mention the Germans again. Um, so yes, you could say it's progress, but it is that self-organizing structure using the energy accessible to itself to do things that each of us as individuals do, are either driven by, as you might call our base instincts of greed, um, needing our dopamine systems triggered by some things, whether it's cigarettes or alcohol or casual sex or cocaine, or 
this process that we get into with the money supply. And there's a reason why they call money the root of all evil. And it's because in the modern world, money is created as debt. But basically, there is never enough money in the world to pay back all of the money that's owed. Because you haven't got the interest. So you have to keep manufacturing the cars and building the restaurants, running the data centers. You have to keep growth going. Because it's only by growing the system that you can create the wealth to pay the interest that we already owe. But the irony being that in order to grow, you have to borrow more. So that you're on this treadmill. The only end to it is to develop a monetary system that doesn't depend on debt-based money. I mean, my, I mean, it's been my answer to things like climate change, that when all else is said and done, if you don't fix the money supply, so if you have a money supply that depends at its essence on growth, it doesn't matter what else you do, you will always damage the environment that we're trying to live in, because there will always be a demand for more. Um, you know, and more in the way we're organized means consuming more energy, producing more stuff, and damaging ever more of the environment. And I think, well, I mean, at the moment, it looks like the only thing that is going to stop us is that there's no more environment left to destroy. That, you know, we're reaching a limit where you can no longer do more. So that was the first part of my bit. <laughs>